We are in John chapter 19 this morning. John chapter 19, I appreciate everyone who has been a part of our service so far. It's good to hear special music and it's good to hear the organ again and it's good to hear our instruments up front, um, so many things and of course some that you don't hear. It's good to see and hear our young people and their teachers and, uh, and take care of them with their programs here now as well. And so um, we have much to be thankful for. But uh, this morning we're going to look at the passage which we've been really, um, it's the crux of every one of the Gospels. It's, uh, it's the part where Jesus is crucified. And um, of course we know, we know the story well. Uh, if there's one story you probably know as a Christian, it's the story of the crucifixion. And there's a reason for that. Um, over the years, over the many years of church history, probably the one prominent symbol that identifies Christianity as an icon is what? The cross, right? People wear them around their necks. We display them at different seasons, at different times. We, um, you know, we all know that the cross is the symbol of Christianity. And there's a reason for that. Uh, because really it was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that gave us any hope before uh, our God. And, uh, and so we, we come to this account today, and I think it's interesting because if I were to ask each of you, when you think of the cross or you think of the crucifixion, what is it that you envision? What is it that you, none of us were there, all we have are the accounts that we've read in the Gospels, uh, and of course today we have the media which is portrayed maybe uh you maybe watched the movie or something the jesus film or the or the um i forget what the other one's called but anyway there's different depictions of the crucifixion with um uh, with various actors and so we have kind of a visualization of what it must have been like and some of you think about the the the, the great pain and the suffering some of you think about maybe the the the, the, the horrific death that Jesus uh, had to go there. Some of you think about, oh, there were three crosses and there were the thieves there too, and I identify with those. Um, and there's so much in the story, so many details. But interestingly enough, John, as he decided through the Holy Spirit's leadership to de define this account for us, he doesn't give us a lot of those details. Most of those intricate you know, knowledge of how things worked and what were the sequence of events and when did the soldiers, you know, what hours and all that did Jesus do these various things and cry out from the cross. These aren't in John's account. Uh, and I think there's a particular reason for that, which we're going to look out and uh, talk about here today. Uh, because when John uh, gives us the account of the crucifixion, he gives us four thoughts about the crucifixion that surround really what the the meaning of it is all about but let's get a little bit of background to start with because of course we've been building up to this for some time and sometime we need a little bit of a refresher on what this was really all about we all know that the uh, crucifixion uh, probably you've heard it many times that it's really one of the most vile and heinous acts and torturous death that mankind really has ever invented um, mankind has invented some very terrible ways to make people die, and the crucifixion, as we've been told, is one, of the, is one of the worst. And while the Apostle John doesn't give us all of the graphic details of what that must be like, um, there's a reason, because he, he wasn't there to highlight in this account the suffering of Christ, but rather to declare the accomplishment of of Christ, And we're going to look at those this morning. So let's start back in verse 16 where we began with the reading. It says, Then they delivered him therefore unto, be, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst now just again john gives us the setting here he gives us a few of the details and uh many of us maybe have already known this from years past but golgotha calvary the place of the skull i mean this was not a 
pleasantly sounding, you know, you don't name something the place of a skull because this is where, you know, the flowers are growing. You know, this, is, this was not a pleasant place to be. Uh, this was a place where the Romans regularly um, would erect these crosses and carry out their punishment uh, against criminals. Uh, Golgotha was a site just outside the walls of Jerusalem. Now, we don't know exactly where it was today, but we do know that it was outside the walls and that it was near one of the main roads that people traveled in order to get into and out of the city. Uh, John accounts for that and various other authors do as well. And uh, honestly, this was by design. The Romans were, if nothing else, I mean, obviously they were cruel, and, and, but they were very calculating as well. <laughs> they, they very much knew what they were doing. And uh, there was a reason why they were setting up crosses and doing crucifixions at this particular site. Because the Romans executed people not merely to punish them or to rid society of their influence. Like we might say we're going to, you know, um, put to death a serial killer to keep him off the streets and so he can't do this again. There, that wasn't the Romans' main goal in carrying out the death penalty. No, their executions were also there to make a public statement. They wanted to make a public statement to all of society that this is a warning. Don't cross the Roman Empire or this could be you. <laughs> this is really what they were trying to do. So when they set up an execution, it was going to be something publicly. They were going to get all the mileage out of it that they could. They wanted everybody coming in and out of the city to see what was happening. And as we will make note, they put the charges right there on the cross so that everybody could come by and say, oh, that's what they did. I better make sure I don't do that. <laughs> and this was a way in which the Romans could uh, exert their control, whether they, they could maintain their power, and they controlled people through fear. And this was ultimately the fate that Jesus was going to see there on that day. This was Golgotha. This was the Roman way. And so as we saw there in verse 19, it says, Pilate wrote a title and he put it on the cross and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And uh, he did this so that um, there, was a, there was a charge, there was a reason why Jesus was being, um, uh, Jesus was being crucified, why he was uh, subject to the death penalty. Now, this may seem like a strange charge because this wasn't a uh, charge against the Roman Empire. Uh, this wasn't a uh, crime worthy of death. Pilate had already said that. He already told the Jews, I don't find any guilt in him. There's nothing here that, you know, criminally we should be involved with. And so he put up the only charge that he was given. And that really is the first, the first few verses here, verses 19 to 22, speak to the first facet of what John wants to uncover for us and reveal to us about the crucifixion. And that is, what is the charge against Jesus Christ? What was the charge? Of course, he wrote this title, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Um, it says, this title then read many of the Jews in verse 20, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. It was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Uh, these were all the three key languages of the day. And it said, Then the, said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. So the first thing we want to talk about is this charge that was against Christ. You notice that he does say that it was written in the three languages of the he people, Hebrew, Greek, and uh, Latin. And, of course, uh, Latin is now a dead language. Maybe some of you remember Latin from grade school days. or I mean, they quit teaching it. I don't know how long ago now. But uh, anyway, Latin was the, was the language that grew out of the Roman Empire. But Greek was really the trade language of the day. Greek was the language that most, uh, most would have learned and known. Uh, the Jews here in this area, most of them may not have known Latin. But they certainly would have known Hebrew by going to the, you know, by growing up and learning Hebrew, and they would have known Greek. Greek would have been a language that they needed to converse with those uh, for trade across the, the 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 Middle Eastern area. And so they they made sure that everyone had an ability to read, 
this charge. There wasn't going to be any excuse. You weren't going to be able to walk by and not know what it said. And uh, anyone could read it in their own tongue. And so the charge brought against Jesus, I think, is very interesting. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Do you notice that this charge is 100% correct? <laughs> this is absolutely true. Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Pilate was 100% correct in stating the charge in this manner. In fact, this was what the Jews had said to him. If we were to look back there at the verses in the, the chapter before, this is what the Jews had accused him of specifically. It was a problem for them, but it wasn't a problem for Pilate. He said, well, this was your accusation, that you're the king of the Jews. But uh, you notice right off the bat, we see the chief priests, they have a problem with this charge. <laughs> they have a problem with the wording. Because just like with many of their own little laws that they were trying to keep, they were pretty squirrely about getting around the ins and outs, right? They could, they could keep the, the, the outside whitewashed and they could keep the inside dead. Remember, we've talked about that with the Pharisees. Over and over again, we see them doing this, manipulating with words and with these little tactics to get around the heart of what the law is. And they had, they had developed this, and this was going to be no, no difference. They wanted the wording changed. They wanted the charge to say and to accuse him of blasphemy. He said he was the king of the Jews. Instead, what did the wording actually do to them? It actually didn't charge Jesus. It charged the Jews. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. Every Jew walking past this would have to say, do I accept him as my king or do I reject him as my king? The charge was there to accuse the Jews as much as it was to say why he was being crucified. And they, they didn't like this because they wanted all fingers to point at Christ. And so uh, they said, we want this wording changed we want uh, them him to say that he, he said this, that he was guilty of blasphemy, but that was not to be the case. John makes sure to bring out this point. The charge for Jesus was really a charge against each one of us. In fact, John starts off his own gospel with these same words, John 1.11. What does it say about Jesus Christ? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Right? This was his own. These were the own that they should have recognized him as their king, as their Messiah, as their savior. And yet they didn't. And, you know, I think the greatest charge against us today is really in the same manner. The greatest charge that we can have against us in our lives is rejecting him as our king. The greatest charge we can have against us is to say, no, he's not my savior. <laughs> Really, isn't that the first decision we have to make when you're going to and if you're going to come to Christ? You have to make the decision. Am I going to allow Christ to be my Savior, to be my King, to acknowledge He is who He says He was, and allow that to transform my life because I accept the free gift of salvation through Him? Because if I reject that, then that charge is really a charge against me. He's not my King. He's worthy of being crucified. It's one or the other. Sometimes we think we can ride the fence somewhere. <laughs> but either we are guilty of putting him on the cross because he's not our king. <laughs> or he was on the cross for us because he is our king. It goes one way or the other. So John makes sure he brings out this point. And then he, we look at verses 23 and 24. 23 and 24 the story continues with the casting of lots. The casting of lots. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said, Therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, of course, John wants to point out to us here that this casting of lots, it may seem like a 
side story. It may seem like almost a rabbit trail. But what is John revealing to us about this casting of lots? That Jesus, even in what he didn't do directly, <laughs> every event that happened around him was a fulfillment of the prophecies that were there of him in the Old Testament. This is a direct fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm 22 and verse 18 that literally says what they said here. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. The psalmist David centuries before had predicted that this was going to occur at the foot of Jesus cross now if that isn't an astonishing thing I don't know what is I don't understand why people um, who don't know the Lord seem to always be uh, stumbling <laughs> over the fact that these are events that couldn't occur in any other way the prophecies of hundreds of years prior had been fulfilled in every minute detail. And um, I think that it seems self-evident that Christ is who he says he is, that scripture all points to Christ as being who he says he is. But here we see the soldiers, and I just want to think about this from their perspective for a moment because they are brought out here in these few verses. Do you realize these soldiers had no clue as to what was going on around them? Do you realize just, I mean, you talk about clueless people. I mean, this is the most clueless you can ever get in all history. These soldiers were sitting at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. While their own redemption was being sacrificed for them, above them, they were concerned with what they were going to do with his clothes. <laughs> they were concerned with what they were going to do with these temporal things that came and went. There's no even evidence of them. We don't have his clothes today. We don't know whatever happened to them down the road. They probably wore out and got thrown in the dumpster somewhere. But this was what the soldiers were doing. All they cared about was the small, inconsequential, low-value, temporary goods that he possessed. They were more concerned with the here and now than what this meant for them for eternity. They were just so unaware they were so involved in the, what they have in front of them that they couldn't see their future. They couldn't see what eternity meant. And you know, isn't that true for many people today? That many, many people today are just like the soldiers. We're caught up in fighting over, you know, who gets this and who gets that and how we're going to divide this or how I'm going to get an extra nickel in my pocket. And, you know, and maybe we even, uh, you know, come up with these schemes to try to to make it fair or whatever it is. And they're so concentrated on the here and now that we don't see the consequences for eternity. It's a time that we as believers have an eternal perspective in our lives. It's time that we get our heads out of the immediate, temporary, going by the wayside types of goods that we have invested so much of our time and money in. It really is not going to matter in a hundred years whether you uh, have a, a red or a blue tie on today. <laughs> Maybe that's why I care so little about some of those things, my, my wife would say. But <laughs> the fact is it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's not going to matter whether you have a big house or a small house. They're all going to end up in the ground. <laughs> it's not going to matter whether you have a job that you just love or a job that you know is 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 uh can't hardly pay the bills it's not going to matter all that's going to matter is christ that's all that's going to matter for eternity christ and your relationship with him and so as we consider this let's not allow ourselves to fall into the same trap that the soldiers did that day to be so wrapped up in the inconsequential that we miss the eternal perspective. Let's keep going. Let's look at verse 25. Verse 25, we see Jesus now responding with care for his family. An interesting, another interesting vignette here. It says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, named Mary, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. I don't think Jesus hollered Mary from the cross, so uh, otherwise there would have been a whole crew of them all turning their head. 
So here we see in verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. The care for his family. You know, I think there is something to be said that John wants to make sure we understand regarding Jesus and the crucifixion. As, as anguishing and painful and torturous that Jesus must have felt as he bore the sins of the whole world on himself. Do you realize that he was never consumed with that? Even in the midst of his greatest pain and difficulty, what was he doing? He was caring for those he loved. He was watching out for his own mother. You see, in that society, in that day and age, a woman who had no one to take, had no husband, had, she wasn't allowed to own property. She couldn't do much of anything, couldn't transact business. She was really at the mercy of her family, who extended family or friends that might take her in and help her out because she had no other means to care for her own, for her own business. And Jesus recognized this. And he wanted to make sure that even his own mother was taken care of. You realize, what does this mean? Even in the middle of all this, Jesus wasn't filled with self-pity. <laughs> Jesus never allowed all of his circumstances to get him to the point where he says, Woe is me, I'm just so bad, all I can think about is my pain. Now, I'm sure that it consumed him in those ways. But even in the midst of that, he didn't allow self-pity to trump his desire for helping others. Jesus was always in the business of caring for someone else. And so we see this play on words. He looks down to John, which, by the way, always likes to describe himself in the third person, and sometimes as the one whom Jesus loved. I always love this about John. He says, uh, he says to John, looks down at John, and he says, uh, he looks to his mother first, and he says, woman, Behold thy son. Now, this wasn't a derogatory way in which he was addressing his mother. In English today, we might say that sounds kind of, you know, uh, crass, but it's not. Uh, this was just a, a way in which you would typically address your mother. So, woman, behold thy son. And then he turns to John, and he says, behold thy mother. And uh, this is a really a play on words. He he uses the same um, the same. Uh, words behind it in the Greek, but really there's a, there's a word play that's going on here. Because on the one side, it had two meanings. On the one side, Jesus' crucifixion, what was it going to do for his own mother's sins? Take care of them, right? It was going to pay the penalty for his own mother's sins. So he's there on the cross. He says, woman, behold your son. I'm taking care of you. I'm paying for your sins right here right now the greatest sacrifice behold your son she would be spiritually cared for by jesus christ but then what does he say john behold your mother he looks at his mother and he says now you look at her and you take care of her in a physical sense and what does john say i took her in from there on out she lived with me she was my guest. We, we made sure that her needs were met for the rest of her life. That's what John's acknowledgement of Jesus' mother was. So in this wordplay of woman, behold thy son, and son, behold your mother, he's saying, I'm taking care of you spiritually, and I'm going to make sure you're taken care of physically. You know, what's our application from this? I think, <laughs> number one, there's not a single one of us that have ever begun to experience the depth of pain and suffering that Jesus did on the cross. We know that to be true. But you know what? We all do experience pain and suffering. <laughs> we wake up and with a crick in our neck and a stiff back, or we have uh, all kinds of other ailments that we get up and take the medicine bottles and start you know, popping the pill for this or that or the other thing. We have all kinds of problems that we have to deal with, right? We have, um, we have physical suffering. And you know what? We have lots of emotional and spiritual and relational types of suffering as well. 
people that have rejected us, people that we have lost, people that bring us hurt. Jesus had all that. And we have the choice, just like Jesus, when we're in the midst of our pain, to say, oh, poor me. Oh, I'm, I, it's all about me. You know, I think I've said this before. There's some people, and I don't know anybody here, but don't get me, t- get me wrong. Some people that you say, how are you doing? And you don't want to know the answer, right? <laughs> because they tell you on and on and on and on, right? Um, you all know people like this. <laughs> they tell you how they're doing. Do you know what? I think if you would ask Jesus on the cross, how are you doing? He would say, how are you doing? <laughs> are you taken care of? Because my care is more about you than it is the pain that I'm going through. This exhibited that. This is what Jesus, John was showing us about Jesus' heart even in the midst of his greatest trial. And yet, we can't get through a day sometimes without wallowing in our own self-pity. We are always to be thinking about others, just as Jesus always looked out for the needs of others as well. So we see the charge against Jesus, the casting of lots, and the care for his family. And of course, we come to really the crux of it, the real, the real meaning behind the cross. And that's found there in verse 28 to 30. And that is the cure for all mankind. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and they put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I think there's some interesting insights into the final moments of Jesus' death here. You know, unlike every other victim of crucifixion that had been punished and died on the cross, they all had something in common. Number one, they were all criminally liable for what they did. But number two, they had no choice in the matter. (laughs) You know, the Roman legions came, they had their forces come and take them. Nobody went, you know, without a fight. (laughs) You know, they they knew how to make sure they were locked down. They weren't getting away. And when they nailed them to the cross, it wasn't because they um, they wanted to be there. Nobody wants to be at the cross, not even Jesus. But the fact is that we see in this this story, this last few verses of this account, that there was no point where Jesus had to resist the guards. (laughs) There was no point where they took his life from him. No, what does the Bible say? He laid down his life for us. And there's a key difference here. What does he say? He he makes sure that he takes care of his family. And immediately after that, what does he say? He's calculating in his mind, John says. He says, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished. I don't know if Jesus had a checklist. Of course, he was perfect. I mean, I'd have to have it written down. You know how many prophecies and things that had to be fulfilled for Jesus to meet every single one? There were hundreds and hundreds of prophecies. Somewhere along the way, over those years of ministry, Jesus had been checking off a list. Okay, I, I did this. Okay, I did fill that prophecy in Isaiah. I was born here. I went to Nazareth. Okay, we did that. And, you know, one by one by one, he was checking the list off all through his life. And here he was at the last moments on his cross. He went through that list one more time. And he said to himself, okay, I've accomplished everything. It's completely fulfilled. All things are now accomplished. Now that I've done that, now he turns and he says that the scripture might be fulfilled. Is one last thing. I thirst. Did he call out for a drink because he was thirsty? No. He called out for a drink to fulfill that one last prophecy. That one last thing that he needed to fulfill. I'm going to ask for something to drink and they're going to give me vinegar. Because that's what the prophet says they're going to do to me. (laughs) And I'm going to fulfill this one last thing. That's what he does. 
The only thing left to pay after this last fulfillment was death. And so it says after he took that vinegar in verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, it was the last thing on the list, and he said, it's finished. The job's done. Everything's fulfilled. I've done what I've come to do. And then he willingly, he bows his head, and he gives up the ghost. It's not like, oh, they took it from him. Jesus willingly gives up his life. I think that's an important point. He didn't die on their terms. He died on his own terms. He was not killed. He was not murdered. He sacrificed himself. And because he was a perfect sacrifice, it means that the, the payment that he made was, was right or, or enough for sin. For the sin of all mankind. And so really the question you need to ask yourself. As he gave up the final, the final moments of his life. We have to ask ourselves. Have we accepted that gift? Maybe you're here this morning and you say. Hey I don't know what that's all about. I don't know how he paid the price for me. And maybe I've never accepted that the fact that his sacrifice was for me but the fact is it was we just need to accept his payment on our behalf Romans chapter 6 says this if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve Sin. Do you realize we're all plagued with sin? <laughs> it's part of humanity. It comes, comes to us naturally. We don't have to learn it. And you know, it's something we have to learn to fight <laughs> all through our life. But if you've come to that place where you've accepted Christ's gift of salvation because of what he did on the cross, what does Romans tell us? That body of sin, that sin that we deserve the punishment for, was crucified on the cross with him. And what does it say? That henceforth we should not serve sin. It doesn't mean that sin won't sometimes get the best of us. But we no longer will get the penalty for sin. We also now have the power to get ahead of sin in our life. And you know, some of us, many Christians, they come to this place where we accept Christ, we say we believe in Him, we say we've got salvation, but we find ourselves still serving sin. <laughs> we find ourselves that sin still has the power over us. You know that in the same way Christ chose to be sacrificed that day, we have to choose no longer to serve sin in our life. We have to make that choice. And Christ says, if you make that choice, you no longer have to be a slave to sin. <laughs> I w Before you knew me, you would have been a slave. You didn't have a choice. <laughs> but now that you know me, you don't have to be a slave to the sin in your life. What does he say? Crucify yourself with Christ. That's what he's, Paul says in Galatians 2.20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the heart of the crucifixion. There's a cure for sin for all mankind. It's a message that we need to share with others. And it's a crucifixion that needs to mean something to us every day. Sin no longer has to be a power that we serve. We have to serve the power that's only found in Jesus Christ.